I'm not in the business of, of making records that people can achieve, you know, in a human sense. I'm in the business of making records that the band wants to hear. They want to hear that sound. That's what they're gonna. See. That's what they're gonna hear. And the guys on YouTube talking shit. I mean, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, if anything, a lot of times triggers highlight the problems. You know, the dynamics. Yeah, it eliminates that problem. But if you're shaky on your feet, it's really a lot more noticeable when you're pounding away at a 127 velocity kick drum hit. You know, versus you know you listen to listen to the old Metallica records or the Megadeth records when they're hauling ass or Slayer. They're hauling ass at 200, you know, and then you isolate those drums and they're sloppy as hell. But it's cool and you don't hear it because they're not triggered. Today our guest is metal producer Mark Lewis. Mark is from the Maryland area where he grew up playing guitar and learning how to produce bands. And then he made his way down to Florida where he started working with Jason Sukoff at Audio Hammer Studios. Those guys produced, mixed, engineered tons of metal records down there. Lots of cool stuff. And that's where I first met Mark, at least by phone. He would call with some cymbal needs for some of our Minel Cymbals artists that were down there working on records. And he was always a great guy. Fast forward to today, and in the last few years, Mark ended up just north of Nashville in Hendersonville, Tennessee. He set up shop there, and, and he's working on a home studio. So I got in touch with Mark and asked him if he'd be willing to do this podcast, and he was gracious enough to grant me plenty of time. So I picked his brain over all kinds of things relating to his job, and he didn't hold back. He shared tons of stuff. It was great. Just so you're aware of his track record, Mark has done, like I mentioned, tons of metal. Bands such as Fallujah, Devil Driver, Coal Chamber, Cannibal Corpse, Whitechapel, Carnifex, The Black Dahlia Murder, Battle Cross, Six Feet Under, God Forbid, Unearth, Scale the Summit, Devil Driver, Deicide, Char Walls of the Damned, Death Angel, Job for a Cowboy, Cataclysm, August Burns Red, Chimera, Trivium. It just keeps going. The list just keeps going. The guy's done a ton, and he's going to keep doing a ton because he's a super cool dude. It's funny, though, because when you first meet him, the guy's really tall. He's got arms like ham hocks. I mean, the guy's he's big dude and long hair, a lot of stubble on his face and a good metal scowl when he's not actually smiling. And then when you say hello, man, the guy's really kind. Got a nice warm greeting, nice smile, just shakes your hand. Cool dude. And he'll sit down and share a lot of info with you. So... I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast as much as I enjoyed actually doing the interview. And on to the podcast. I'd like to welcome everybody into the Minel Radio Podcast. Today we've got the modern day legendary metal producer, <laughs> Mark Lewis, with us. All right, what's up, man? What's up, Mark? Thanks I don't for know about time. legendary, but thanks for the kind words. Come on, man. I heard about you long before I met you. All right, cool. All right, all right. So uh, we're going to get like the most important question out of the way first. Yeah. So I'm a history geek. Yeah, man. And uh, you're from Maryland. Yep. So during the American Civil War, Maryland was neutral. It actually had sympathizers for both sides yes. within the state. Mm -hmm. When Robert E. Lee marched up from the south, he told all his men, hey, play it cool, because we're in the state where they could swing either way, right. be on your best behavior. So as a native Marylander, if I said that right, um, how does like... The, the state feel about their situation these days like when people think about like their connection to the past uh, depends on where you're at man because you know where I grew up it's southern Maryland and people and maybe not here in Nashville so much but people like if I'm in the north people think I have a southern accent and I I don't know that I do but there is an accent in in Maryland uh, in southern Maryland for sure and it's very identifiable and it's kind of to, to me where the south begins but it, it's it's neutral i mean i get called a yankee here and i'm like guys i don't you know it's not really yankee territory up there but it's a it's a weird thing because it's you know some people are very adamant about it i think maryland itself would consider it self a northern state you know but the history kind of says otherwise you know I yeah mean, I, I think the the principal of my high school this is hilarious considering that you know where where it is located he was a member of the sons of confederacy and we used to see the principal in my high school walking around in a confederate uniform Whoa. at the state fair and everybody was like what the hell but uh you know there's there's both there's both there i don't know it's like one of those things you know it's it's well below the mason dixon line where i grew up 
I so I have no idea, man. <laughs> I, I really don't know, but I think that that Maryland would say would 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 prefer to not be included in the Confederate part of the history. But it sure seems Southern where I grew up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's funny. I'm, like I said, I'm a geek. So mm-hmm. when I sat down and was thinking, man, I need to ask him some questions. What do yeah. we talk about? And I thought, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and honestly, like you know, you you could ask like the Periphery Boys are from from. Maryland too, and and once you kind of get above D.C., man, there's um, there's no doubt in my mind that is that's northern territory oh, yeah, totally. to me. Yeah, yeah. But below D.C., where I grew up, people talk differently. the The food's different. The culture's different. You know, so it, it. I don't know. You know, it's it's so, and, and it's getting to be such a mishmash up there. But yeah, I mean, I would say that it's it's pretty neutral. Yeah. Still. Yeah. All right. Next random question for you. Sure. Uh, now, people who are listening, you can't see Mark, and if you've never seen him, he's really tall, and he's got some fucking guns on him. <laughs> so, dude, you're built like a baseball player. Did you ever play baseball before you got into I, music? I did, but, uh, dude, I used to I used to not be so uh, filled out. I mean, I, I was almost this tall when I was 14. Whoa. I was like 6'1 when I started high school, and now I'm 6'3. I didn't grow much. Um, and I was like maybe six foot, six foot one and 135 pounds. Wow. <laughs> and now I'm like almost 235. So it was, I graduated high school, I was about 200. And then I, and then I started eating healthier once I started working in the studio a lot. And then I lost a bunch of weight. So I was like a buck 80. So it wasn't until, I don't know, 10 years ago that, that I started filling out more and being in the gym, but I did play sports and I was really good at injuring myself. So between skateboarding and football and baseball injuries, that's what drove me to play guitar. Like I, I broke my leg horribly when I was 12. And that pushed me to start playing guitar a lot more. Because I had bought a guitar when I was 11. And was taking a little bit of lessons. And then I, it was like September... It was in 95. I broke my leg. I mean, just horribly bad. Like, playing sports? Skateboarding. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, sports. Um, but then I had, you know, I had hand injuries and you know broke my ankle once and you know i've like you know i've used to fuck myself up pretty good and it was it was the injuries that made me go maybe i shouldn't do this maybe i should maybe i'm better at at music i don't think that's an uncommon story yeah actually kind of people have sort of that dual love as a kid between Mm -hmm. sports and music and one thing makes them go one way or the other yeah i love it my my brother-in-law is a retired baseball player he was a he's a pitcher and he was drafted by i believe the indians in early 2000s and then he played I want to say he played under the Indians and then the, then the Nationals but then he was mostly AAA and then he was played in a league called the Atlantic League for a long time which is in Maryland where I grew up and he played in I think Puerto Rico Mexico all that stuff and he's he was a pro pitcher and you wow. know made a living and retired and now he's you know they live in Murfreesboro so that's how cool. I ended up here in Nashville like I was telling you earlier my sister married a guy from here and here I am I ended up moving here because I loved it that's cool. Well, yeah. We're glad to have you. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be here. It's the best town ever to make records in, if you ask me. Well, speaking of records, I had read an interview with you on some website where you said that you started listening to your parents' records when you mm-hmm. were a kid. That's, yeah. how, that's how you got into them. Yep. Um, and that eventually your parents started buying you your own albums at a pretty oh, young yeah. age. Well, what was the first album of your dad's that like really lit a spark for you as far as love for music? Uh, Santana, Abraxas. And then, what was the first album that your parents bought for you? Uh, on vinyl, mm-hmm. Motorhead, No Remorse. <laughs> did you tell them, or did they just know? No, because they knew that I was into Motorhead, and I mean, dude, this was in high, this was not in high school; it was in middle school. Because I remember listening to that record, and you know, I still went to, to Catholic school, so I remember putting on a uniform and listening to that record. And um, uh, I had started getting interested in vinyl. Because it was just cooler to me. I mean, I had CDs. I got a CD player in the early 90s, like everybody else. And, um, you know, it was like slowly phasing out cassettes. But then, like, my parents' vinyl was so much cooler to me. I remember listening to the Bee Gees and, like, anything that would make my my dad's speakers move. It's just, you, you probably saw them in my house. It's those JBL 4311s that are sitting by all the vinyl. I grew up listening to music on those speakers, and it was... They have the big white cones, you know. It looks like a giant NS10, really, but it pre- predated the NS10. Anything that would make those speakers move, like, and sound big, I would want to put on. And uh, How did they know to buy you that album? Because I was into Metallica and Megadeth and all that stuff, and I had bought... I feel like I bought something Motorhead-related, and it wasn't like the Ace of Spades or anything. It was another... 
Maybe it was one of their 90s records. Like Eat the Rich or something? No. No, it would have been like maybe 1916 or like something that came out early 90s. And um, I think I might have found that in a thrift store. And then they were like, that's not so bad. Maybe we'll, you know, and, and they would go antiquing in D.C. And they like came across that and brought that home for me. I mean, day. dude, like as far as buying a Motorhead record goes, yeah, like they pretty much bought you one of the top shelf liquors of Motorhead. Yeah, well, it's like the greatest hit, right? I mean, it's like it's and it's got that cover everybody knows, and it's yeah. the be- it's one of the best covers. I still have it. It's in there. It's it's you know it's a dual it's a gatefold dual yeah. LP man. A thing just ruled, and it has "Killed by Death" on it, which is one of this days one of my to this day one of my favorite songs of all time. Not even just Motorhead songs. And it was like the, you know, since I got, you know, way into Motorhead, it was like the one of the few times they were a four piece and, you know, just, man, there's just so much cool stuff about that record. Yeah, I've had that record, you know, 25 years or something, man. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, close to it. Well, you began your journey as a guitar player, but how long was it from the time that you started playing guitar until you started playing with a drummer and a bass player and being in a band? And uh, what, what was that initial experience like the first time you hooked up with people and played? I started playing when I was like 11 or 12, and it was, by my second year of high school, maybe my sophomore year, I was jamming with kids. I met my, met my friend Bobby McLaughlin. He was, he's a, he was a Metallica freak, too. And uh, we started jamming, and we could never find a drummer good enough. It was never, that was like the thing. I, I couldn't find any drummers that were good enough in, in the Maryland area. <laughs> So we were always jamming with kids. And then, you know, we did find a guy that was good enough, and he was a maniac. He's actually passed away now, unfortunately. But I I can't say that without laughing because he was such a crazy guy. Man. Yeah. He was so insane. And he was a great drummer, and we ended up playing the talent show, high school talent show with him. And um, just just a maniac of a dude. And it's kind of been like the the – how it's gone with all the drummers I work with now they're all really? maniacs really? <laughs> yes. but they're also usually like I'm usually closest with drummers and bands so often you know um, but yeah it was it was like my sophomore year that we started doing that and then I didn't really write anything that I was really proud of until I was 18 or 19 I think hmm. and then it was like you know it was just total at the gates worship and yeah. Swedish you know, melodic death metal I had gone down that hole. And, you know, I listen back to it now. I still think it's good stuff. But it, I couldn't keep a band together with that, with the singer and guitar player and that, you know, because it was just, you know how it is being in bands, like being married to four guys. Oh, yeah. And even then, when I was doing demos and stuff, like the allure of recording was there because I was so obsessed with guitar sounds that the engineers were asking me things when I was doing demos they're like dude your guitar sounds great you know what's your rig here and this and that and it was always like gear talk gear talk gear talk and then I'm like man maybe I can you know we're paying this guy 60 bucks an hour like maybe I should do this you know like and it, and it was then it went from yeah that's that's really how it, how it worked I mean it was the allure was there well yeah. when you started playing guitar when you first started practicing on your own and you're literally just trying to piece stuff together uh-huh. so nowadays every guitar player can download any kind of app that's a click track uh-huh. um, just any uh, tempo device and they can practice if they're smart they'll mm. practice along to it sure so w- when you were coming up and that stuff wasn't there yet no not at what all what did you use to practice along to was it just albums albums and I mean I, I remember like I remember when I started playing to a click it was I was young you know 14 or what 13. was the device it was just a, a metronome it was it was a say a say I can't remember this a Sabine or Sabine however you say it metronome and it was just you know it's like the size of your iPhone just plug in a couple of double A batteries, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, and you just sit it on your on your music stand and you play along to that. But yeah, I mean, and, but of course, I mean, I'm like playing along to Slayer, Live Undead, and Sepultura, Rise, and <laughs> yeah. you know every Metallica record, and you know trying to play Rust in Peace, and you know all that shit. Like, and you know the first stuff I learned, like the first solo I learned was Black Magic Woman by Santana. But then it was like, ah, I want to play riffs, you know, and you know, and then you, you get your rhythm chops together, and then you know, then I got really into the shred stuff and theory and. Yeah, I, I was absolutely. Uh, my dad kind of threw the book at me because he was a musician growing up. He wasn't anymore. He's a 
he's just a, he's a contractor now. He's a, always been a home builder. But his dad was, I guess, an amazing musician. I didn't really know him, but he was like, you know, you need to learn how this shit works. He's like, I see you're taking music pretty seriously. If you're going to do this, you need to learn theory. You need to learn how to read music. You need to learn what, what, how this works. Because you need to learn communicate with other musicians. And he was right. I didn't want to. So you can play Metallica all day, but if you can't tell somebody what notes what, yeah, you know, you're good luck. Hmm. So, well, at what point did you start chasing really great tones? Young, young. I started bothering me like it was like an obsession. I was like chain, chain, uh, chaining my dad's cassette decks together to like get m- multiple tracks and like. And I was like, why, you know, why can't I mic up with this guitar amp and have it sound like the Black Album? And it's like, because <laughs> you know, it's like obvious now to me but not only did i need to practice but i didn't have the equipment but um yeah it was early man um yeah kind of blanking on on what i was going to say there but but early on the bug hit you hard oh for chasing tone yeah it was uh it was big it was big because i i i had I don't know. Everybody starts out with that, you know, the crate GX15 or a PV Bandit or something like yeah. that. You know, I, I had one of the crates, and then I got a Marshall Valve Estate, and then I got a 412, and then it's like, oh, well, I don't like the Marshall distortion as much, so I want to try a different distortion pedal. And it was back and forth and this and that. And then I got one of those Johnson Millennium heads, which is like it was kind of like the line rival to Line Six. Okay. But Digitech made it. It was just Digitech 2112 in a or 2120, whatever you call it, in an amp form, really. Huh. If I showed you the, the the rack piece, you'd you'd realize what it is. But they kind of put it into an amp form, and I thought it sounded much better than the Line Six stuff. It sounded much more real. So that's when I started building rigs. I got that thing, and then I got a Mesa Boogie Two power amp. And I'm I'm in high school, like building these rigs and like saving up money. And it was it was constant. And then it was you know a tri axis rig and a you know Mesa shit and Marshall shit and you know it was just constant. Well, did you ever have like what was the time when you did you ever have to make a conscious decision between being a band guy and then moving over into engineering slash producing? And yeah. What was that moment? Um, well, be, doing demos was one of them because people were always asking me for help with their guitar sounds. But really, I decided I, I went to Berkeley for two summers and I didn't go. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't like a, a real Berkeley student. They had a summer program. It's like a five or six week program. And my best friend and I when at the time I was still one of my still one of my best buddies and we went up there and just you just like get your ass kicked into being a musician I mean you have to audition and it's all this pressure and and I took a recording class I think both summers I was there and the first time I I was there I took one it's the first time I ever saw an SSL in person and mm. you know a big mixing console and I'm like man this is amazing and the funny thing was is I got all, I think, pretty much straight A's in, in, in that Berkeley stuff. But on that recording class, I got a D. <laughs> because I, I like, I, I, I missed a class or something. I don't even remember missing it. Oh. You know? Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't fucking off. Like, because I didn't really fuck off there. Like, it was always like, how much can you play guitar in a day? And then maybe we'd go down to the river at night, but never when there was classes. It was never nothing that I would intentionally miss. And it was so funny because I think back on that now and I'm like, man... That class was like the thing I looked forward to the most, and I don't remember how I missed one or if it, I got mismarked or something, but I still remember that, and it's so funny. But that, I think maybe that first time at Berkeley was what really bit me, and seeing that, and 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 honestly, man, it felt I felt more accomplished doing the recording, and I didn't feel responsible for all these other people to keep a band together, mm. you know? Obviously, a lot of people do it, but I didn't have that luck. I never had the luck of finding four guys so you liked the idea of being self-contained self-contained and being such a gearhead man i was always kind of really just attracted to collecting gear and amassing things and why do things sound a certain way and you know how do I, it's you get a little bit more of a i guess you can be more of a junkie for uh shock value when you're in recording I mean, I guess if I guess if you're if you're a touring guy, you know, you, you get that every night. But like, it's these different experiences when you're making records to to constantly, you know, make these 
awesome things that you believe in, you mm-hmm. know. Um, whereas when you're in a band, you're only making you know a record every two years, or mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's a different experience, different attachments, you know. But it was just kind of where my brain went, you know. It's like yeah. what I, what I wanted to do. Well, how did you end up going from Maryland all the way down to Florida to work with Jason Sukoff? Full full sail. So and, you went down to full sail. Yeah, and and not to badmouth it, but it was a grave mistake educationally. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. What was not cool about? I it? just felt like Billy Madison. They're like, yo, this is an SM fifty seven. I'm like, yeah, no shit. Like, what are we here to do? We learn how to. <laughs> we're gonna learn how to record. Or are we gonna? It's like, but I guess you know, I'm forgetting that people didn't didn't know this stuff and it just doesn't seem like to me that if that's where you're starting for school i'm not sure that recording is going to be your destination you know it's like mm-hmm. you should be a musician you should be knowing what you want if it's like ah, i think i'm going to try recording for a career it's like no dude like you don't and you pay a lot of money to you go pay to a lot sale, of money right? yeah i mean i think at the time my tuition was like forty grand. So if you go to full sale and you walk in, you don't want to be shown like this is what we call a recording console. You want to be shown the deep, deep dive. Me, yeah. I mean, that's where I but was. But you would think that's what it would be. You would think that's what it would be, and you don't get to that until month nine. Oh. And I had, you know, I was twenty years old when I moved down there. It was two thousand three. So it was, it was just, it was disheartening, you know, because I'm like surrounded by three hundred kids. And most of them, I felt, were musical, you know, what's the word? Just completely new. A lot of them didn't play instruments or anything. And there's like four or five of us that were that were musicians. And I think you know, a lot of those guys are still working today. How in the hell did all those other kids end up at full set? Right, yeah. And I, I'm sitting here. I, I had done four semesters of advanced theory and had done... You know, two two years of high school theory before that, and and then I'm I'm I go to to a musicianship class. You know, I think in month three, and they're like, uh, "Do re mi," shit, and I'm just like, uh. I pulled the teacher aside. I'm like, "Hey, um, yo, man, like, uh, I'm I'm kind of way past this. way past this." And he's <laughs> yeah. like, "You can take the test." I took it the next day and got a hundred percent. And it was, I'm not even bragging about it. It was a joke. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the n- months 9 through 12 at that school, they, they were they were cool. You know, we were working on SSLs and Amex and stuff like that. But it's just a big mess of kids turning knobs on million-dollar consoles. And, and I don't know, dude. I mean, me and recording education, I don't believe in it. I believe it's a, a trial and error thing. I think that that yeah there's a lot of good information out there now but you can't teach somebody how to make decisions and that's what I'm paid for there's a million dude I could teach my daughter to put a mic on that cabinet behind us you know what I mean and she could probably put it in a place where it sounded good but you know she, you have to make the decisions and you have to know number one you know what the band wants and how to deal with people and all these other things and i just don't think it's a teachable art you know um and i i i it's really a big turnoff for me especially now like the internet and stuff like that like this stuff is what i want to hear i want to hear guys that i look up to talking you know like if if there's a, a max norman or a bob rock podcast like you better believe i'm listening to that shit you know, because I want to know what they went through. I want to know, like, what decisions they're making. And I don't, you know, aside from signal flow and electronics, I don't feel like there's a lot to teach, man. You know what I mean? Um, it's just learning by doing. Yeah, learning by doing and, and screwing up. And, and that's why you don't charge a lot when you're new. You say, come in, let me do your song for free. And, and you know, if somebody's expecting a hit, you know, they, they're crazy. But... You know, I didn't make any money when I started this. Neither did Jason. So how did you meet Jason? Uh, I think a friend of mine at Full Sail was talking about this guy in, in Orlando that had a metal studio. And I believe I I think that's what happened. I, I emailed Jason. Somebody told me about him. I think it was my friend Josh told me about him. And uh, I emailed him, and it was like, Hey, dude, uh, I'm into metal. I go to Full Sail. I play guitar. You know, we both play like he he had a website. I remember, and he's like had he's a bunch of seven strings all over his website. I was like, I got a seven string, and you know, just nerdy shit. You know, and he wrote me back the next day. He's like, Hey man, sounds cool. Come down, hang out. I need some help. 
Wow. So, like, he got right back to me, and I went down there, and I met his brother, Jordan, who's like, he's a hip-hop producer now, big-time guy, mm-hmm. and um, he was an incredible drummer, and Jason was like, there, you know, in, in his fucking chair with the fucking, you, you know, Ibanez Universe strapped on. He's like, let's fucking jam, man. First time I met him, it wasn't even like anything. I walk in his studio and he's like, let's jam. We jammed. And then we were just like, you know, best friends, man. And he's still one of my best friends, you know. And you, we ran a studio together for 12 years. You know, he owned it. I, I helped run half and, and it was it was a great thing. This is Audio Hammer? Yeah. And was it already was it called Audio Hammer at the time already? Yeah, it was. It had been. I think he's had Audio Hammer since '99. I think he named it that, wow. or 2001. I mean, he's been at it a long time, man. You know, Jason's a a prodigy, and he has a, 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 as much experience as guys much older than him. You know, hmm. so. And when so now you're down in Audio Hammer, and when was the first time you felt like you knew what you were doing at getting good drum tones? Uh. I assume it was before Audio Hammer, but maybe you like really fine tuned it once you got there. I, you know, it was. I did a record with, with when I was talking about that Swedish death metal stuff. I did a record. Actually, Dave Elitch played drums on it. This is like 2004 because Dave and I met at Berkeley, and we've been just mm-hmm. very close for you know, better part of 20 years. And um, he. Uh, he came out and did the drums on that, and that was a good one. That was like I felt like I was kind of getting lucky, but I also kind of knew what I wanted. I wasn't great at drum tuning yet, and um, yeah, it was probably some time in in early Audio Hammer. I mean, like when we did "Bury Your Dead," "Beauty and the Breakdown," Mark Castillo. Yeah, yeah. Minel, he he the, used to be a Minel guy. Yeah, there's Minels on that record. Okay, I'm pretty damn sure. Nice dude. It's like a mixture of Minels and Zildjian's, I think. It's whatever we had laying around. Yeah, sure. But it was... And by the way, for people who are listening, that's the way it goes in the studio. Yeah. Just because a guy's endorsed doesn't mean that's what he's going to play on the album. I it, to... It's always a mix, man. And, and you know, it's, it's very rare that somebody doesn't understand that. But, yeah, I mean, there's, I got everything in here. But, um, yeah, that, that record was the one. But it was also great drummer, great room, great song. Yeah, you know, and Jason, I was like 22 when we made that record. I think Jason was 25 or something. Yeah, yeah, Jason would be 25. I would have been 22. And I remember we hearing the songs, and we're just like, ah, this might be cool. It's kind of the song is kind of boring. <laughs> and then we like got the drums done. And we're like, oh my god, this is incredible. Mark did the drums, I think, in seven hours on that record. Like nothing we ever done before. Wow. We got the drums tuned up. It was at Morris Sound, which is, you know, rest in peace, really. That's in it's, Tampa? Yeah, it's in Tampa, which it's gone. Oh, it's owned by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra guys, and I don't know what kind of condition it's in. Now, it's, that's the old, like, death metal, like, it's the that's Mecca. the Hall of Fame. It's the Mecca. But the thing about that studio is, I mean, Jim and Tom Morris, Tom's like a, uh, not to get too sidetracked, but Tom, I want to say he was a chemical engineer or uh-huh. some sort of, like, really, you know, smart dude, you know. And I think he made... Made some money, young, and got paid off an invention or something. I don't remember. I could be speaking out my ass. But that's how they opened that facility. And Morris Sound was not some small thing. I mean, you could fit an orchestra in the A room there. Is that the same Morris that now owns the tracking room, basically, Mm -mm. up in Nashville? Because it's called Morris. Anyway. No, they have another studio. They sold it to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra guys. And now they have another studio, I think, in downtown Tampa. And it's gorgeous. It's in an old bank. All right, I'm going to metal trivia geek out for a second. Yeah. Is one of the guys from Trans-Siberian, was he in Sabotage? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think it was uh, Oliva, John Oliva, right? The guitar. John or Chris Oliva, well, either one the of them. The guitar I could, player. Yeah, I, I'd see Sabotage gets out of the death metal and into the power metal side of things, yeah. where I started to lose myself. If we were talking death metal, I'd be able to tell you names and birthplaces and all sorts of shit, but... Yes, yeah, the sabotage relation for sure. Okay, yeah. gotcha. But um, I think it was the guitar player, not the singer. So it was like, it was Chris a, Olivia. Yeah, yeah, it was Chris. I don't know. They're they're all involved. Cool. They're not. Yeah. Either way, I mean, I know that is that is definitely accurate. But um, yeah, no. That but back to the drum sounds. I mean, that was when I started getting real comfortable. My early twenties, and I was tuning the drums then. 
and it wasn't I wasn't even great super great at it then and then I was tuning stuff and I got started getting real burnout on it when Jason and I were kind of splitting off and doing our own things and that's when I started hiring techs a long time ago to like, just to save you time and headache yeah man it's just like it went to the it got to the point where I was you know going insane running back and forth from the the control room to the to the drum room and just losing my shit tuning toms and you know I, I was like, okay, I'm I'm hiring somebody. And yeah, do I do I like cutting that check? No, but do I like how it sounds when it's done? Because I can sit in there and tell them what I want. Yeah. You know. Oh, dude, I get it. When I first moved to Los Angeles in my early twenties, I made a side hustle just tune in for engineers mm-hmm. on, on the side. They'd pay me hundred bucks to go right. in for a few hours and be that guy sitting in the room while they sat behind the console. And it's huge, man. And and there is engineers that do it, and there's engineers that are great at tuning. And you know, I don't have the patience for it anymore. I, I want to sit in there and, and I I want to hear that lug being turned on the mic. And it's yeah, I'm just fanatical about it. I mean, we you know this this 14 inch Yamaha is sitting here. I mean, we we spent almost two days getting that thing tuned right on the Havoc record. and You know, you just... So I know that you have drums that you bring into sessions. Cause mm-hmm. I've been in one of your sessions before when Naveen was playing mm-hmm. with Whitechapel. Yeah. And you had your kit set up. Mm-hmm. So I guess along the way, from the time you started at Audio Hammer up till having your own drums, it's been a mishmash where maybe a guy brings in his own kit. Yeah. How often did you encounter drummers that didn't have a clue about how to make their kit sound good? Oh, it was often. And it's funny, you know, it's almost like a reward because when you're first starting, you end up playing with recording guys that are kind of on your level of skill. So you end up kind of recording guys that aren't so great, that don't know what they're doing. And now as you get better, you end up recording guys that are better. But yeah, it was often. And I feel like it's gotten better now, but still a lot of drummers don't know how to don't know how to tune and a lot of them don't know how to hit. And I'm not even a drummer. And I'm like, dude, look, you know, like I have to stop a take. It's like you need to be hitting that snare in the center of the drum. When you say hit, you're talking about consistency, of, consistency, of volume and tone. Yeah, volume and tone, and even where they're striking the drum. It's like vibrato on a guitar player. You know, it's like I, when I say a guy has a good wrist, it's like, you know, there's guys that just have that great wrist. They got that snap. You know, like Elitch being one of them. Naveen, incredible tone. Ben uh, Harker wrote it was in Chapel. Or Alex Rudinger. You know, Mark Castillo. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, I have so many guys. Kevin Talley. And it's you can you can listen to these drummers and you know almost who's playing by how way the drums stroke. You know, the way the drum is, is stricken or whatever the word is. And uh, yes, I just hear it. You know what I mean? And like I would, I remember having to tell guys, you know, or not remember still having to tell guys, if you're not hitting that drum in the center, or you're not, you know, I need a better rim shot from you or whatever. And I'm not even a drummer, you know, hmm. so. And so, um, what was the, like, when was the first time you moved from straight engineering into a producer role? Early. I was not, it wasn't, it was never anything I adopted. The bands, the bands did that for me. I never said I'm going to be a producer on this record. It was like the first time I think anybody really gave me a co-production role was Seamless in 2005 or six. Derek Kurzweil? Derek Kurzweil, incredible drummer. Uh, Minel guy too. Um, Derek Kurzweil and Jesse Leach and um, and Pete Cortez and uh, Jeff... Uh, oh my God, I can't remember his last name. He's just the best dude ever. Jeff played bass. Jeff Fultz. And... Uh, yeah, man, I was young, 21 or 2. And I was working for Jason, and we were all under the same management. I wasn't. I was working for Jason. Jason was under the same management as Seamless. And Jason was involved in the record, but he was busy, and, and they wanted to record at Longview Farms in Mass. Long story short, I go up there. I spent a couple weeks up there, and beautiful studio, and... You know, just got very hands-on. You know, it was like my opinions mattered to them, which was cool. And then I got the record credits, and I was a co-producer. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm a co-producer now, you know? So and you just found yourself offering input, and they, they listened and implemented some of what you... They were... asked, you know? Yeah. They asked, okay. and it was... Because I didn't feel like I was in a point then where I was able to offer it. And then the, the other guys that really pushed for me to be producer was Black Dahlia Murder. They were like... 
they pushed me to say, you know, dude, you're you're you've produced our record. You know, it wasn't me saying I want to produce. It was like you guys, and I got lucky in that sense. You know, I, I that's why I'm, I I feel like guys have to earn it. You know, um, and not everybody takes the same journey. Obviously, some guys are born to be producers, and I was kind of. It was it was a slower thing for me, I guess. You know, no, I wouldn't say slow, but I was just like, all I want to do is make shit sound good. I'm a musician, and then people are like, oh, you're the producer now. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so. So obviously that comes with title first, where you just one day look at the the album comes out and you see your name on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At what point does that did that start to come with like extra pay from the record label? <sighs> did you have to start asking at that point for it? Yes. And I had to get management and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, Jason and I got involved in a situation a long time ago under some management that was like almost a mafia situation. <laughs> and I wouldn't say that, but it was like Jason was the senior and I was the the lesser. And Jason didn't see it that way, but we didn't want to rock the boat. And, you know, there was another producer that was under the same management and, I was kind of like throwing these scraps and things like that. And that's fine. Whatever. It was what it was. But, you know, it's, it's, there's a pecking order that people don't want to see disturbed. And I guess I'm a crotchety old man sometimes too. And I get the same way, but it was like 20, 2009, 10, where I started feeling like I was actually getting paid. It was a good five or six years of, of, Working your way up. Working my way up and not having any money. and It doesn't seem like a lot now, but it seemed like forever then. I mean, dude, it was, you know, there was no weddings, graduations, birthdays that I went to. It was like, I'm in the studio for six months at a time, no days off. And now I'm working eight or ten hour days, 12 hour days, you know. It wasn't, I'm not 24 hours in the fucking track, in the control room anymore. But then it was... You know, yeah, it was five very long, six very long years. So while you're doing all those massive amounts of hours, I, this makes me think of something you said earlier, which made me laugh on the inside. You said being in the studio all the time got you to eat healthy. And I thought, oh my God, that's completely the opposite of what most dudes do. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm sensitive to that stuff. Okay. And, and I totally agree with you. Um, and it's funny, I funny, I feel like it's changing now because a lot of guys in bands are like fit. Like even 10 years ago, nobody in bands worked out. And now everybody's like, Hey man, do you work out? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I work out. Like, you know, like we're going to, we'll work out when we make this record. Whereas before it was like, I saw it change. I feel like it started changing with bands got health minded and whatever. And I don't know why that is, but I think um, just more information that's out there. Yeah. But I'm just sensitive to food, man. I'm sensitive to what I eat and if I eat bad I feel like crap and then I don't focus and I'm just a you know I'm a typical artist mind like I'm bad at focusing and bad at organization and you know so if I have my food done and I have my day laid out in that sense it's a lot less likely that I'm gonna waste an hour doing something stupid Mm. you know or, or go eat the wrong thing and fall asleep in the you know in the chair um so we're sitting in the studio out behind your house that you're slowly but surely getting up and running, yeah. and it's your drum room, and you've got a couple of kits. We were talking about it earlier. Is uh-huh. These kits, do you take them with you on every session you do? Yes. What's your go-to? Like, if you had to break it down to, like, what essentially is the go-to kit, like a five or six pieces of it, what would it be? Uh, for years, it's been the Yamahas, but, I mean, I have these, these Gretches, too. And and really that was to have the you know it's like to have like the Les Paul and the Strat the two different sounds, but yeah it's Yamaha recording customs I've always loved I've always loved a Birch drum, um, I mean I do like Maple stuff obviously the Gretsch too, but um, so always, ma- Maple kick drum Maple kick well yeah you know what's funny is I don't care for the Yamaha kicks as much but the toms are unbelievable the Gretsch toms aren't everybody's cup of tea they're a lot you know they're a lot more vintage sounding and you can get them to sound real heavy metal like listen to Lars or somebody like that but the Yamahas just they almost sound done before you even EQ them yeah so they're very impressive to the to the client and they're easy you put like whatever it could be Remo or Evans or Aquarium but do you put basically like a clear emperor on them it's always clear emperor on the top and bastard on the bottom yeah um, they've just got a nice slap and tone yeah and they're controllable 
you know, whereas, you know, you, you just have a lot more to go on. And then, you know, like I have the old bell brass here and I have a couple other brass snares, but those are usually like controlled sound on the top. Or if the drum's thicker, I'll use like that drum craft as a six millimeter shell instead of a three. I use an ambassador coated on the top of that. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't, if you start to use a controlled sound, it starts to get a little too choked. And yeah, little, you know, how thick the shell is. Yeah. yeah, and so you use a thinner shell, and you get a lot of snap. And there's also flange hoops on that drum. I had die cast on it, and it, and it killed the killed the attack a little bit. But then you you have to have the die cast on the bell brass, you know, things yeah. like that. You just got to find it, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. So you've recorded some total speed demon drummers. Mm-hmm. Um, are triggers a requirement for capturing even sounds with speed demon guys on the kicks? Yeah, especially. I mean, if if they're doing if they're doing dub- if they're doing double strokes or something like that, I mean, forget it. I mean, it's you're capturing a performance at that point where you just want to preserve the the rhythm. Hopefully, you know, if they don't need editing. Um, but then it could be like havoc. I mean, Pete just came in here and murdered it on a fourteen by twenty four vintage Gretsch kick, you know, and it was like we'll we'll probably use a lot of the real kick sound on the record, and. You know, but he's not playing much above 200 on the kicks, you know, maybe some spots. But when the guys are like 230 and 40, I mean, dude, yeah. So what do you have to say to all the naysayers out there that talk shit about guys that have to use triggers? That have to use triggers? Show me a guy that does it without them. And show me how it sounds. That's It's the sound the band's after. I'm not in the business of of, of making records that people can achieve, you know, in a human sense, I'm in the business of making records that the band wants to hear. They want to hear that sound. That's what they're going to say. That's what they're going to hear. And the guys on YouTube talking shit, I mean, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, if anything, a lot of times triggers highlight the problems, you know, the dynamics. Yeah. It eliminates that problem. But if you're shaky on your feet, it's really a lot more noticeable when you're pounding away at 127 velocity kick drum hit, you know, versus, you know, you listen to listen to the old Metallica records or the Megadeth records when they're hauling ass or Slayer. They're hauling ass at 200, you know, and then you isolate those drums and they're sloppy as hell. But it's cool and you don't hear it because they're not triggered. Dude, I was listening the other day to Rain and Blood because <clears throat> my daughter was asking me, uh, she's 11, and she was yeah. saying, hey, what's the record that really you knew for the first time it offended your mom and dad? Oh, and I said, yeah. And I went, oh, shit, that's easy. And I, yeah. So I played Angel of Death for her. Yeah. And um, it gets to the classic breakdown in the middle where Dave Lombardo does his double kick thing and then right. Tom's over it. And when you listen to that double kick thing, I mean, it's un, it's uneven in terms of consistency mm-hmm. of sound. Yeah. there's it's Clearly it wasn't triggered. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I guess to the triggers now offset what would have, they would what would have been considered an issue yeah it's a give or take i mean i just you know the guys that 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 knock on triggers okay does it even out dynamics yes but does it it's it it's not cheating in any sense because you end up with a whole new set of problems with the ones you wipe away yeah you know and so the main the main goal is consistency of sound mm-hmm. and then the drummer better have his act together so that all those other new sets of problems don't show themselves. Yeah, and I mean obviously we can we can edit stuff too, but yeah, I mean it's it's a necessary evil, but at the same time, I mean with the exception of the kick drums, you know, like and even with the kick drums, a lot of times I'm triggering kicks and then my assistant, you know, mix guy John, he will go through very with a fine tooth comb through the kicks and and lay things in, in, in specific velocities because we we don't want the double kicks pounding at 240. We want them pulled back because we know that's how it sounds. It's going to sound more realistic that way. And then the, the hands, it's like, man, maybe we iron out some of the rim shots. But if I'm laying triggers, I don't want anybody to know I'm laying triggers on the hands. You know, in yeah. 2008 or nine, you can listen back to my records when it, you know it's obviously we we had all just gotten a sound replacer and it's like go 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 go. You know, like the <laughs> rim shot on a on a fill or whatever but nowadays i mean dude i'm so we're so meticulous about preserving dynamics and when i'm producing like i want to get the most the most velocity and the most big performance out of the guys so we don't have to trigger and if we do have to trigger it's it's undetectable yeah you know that's the thing you don't I, to me it's so distracting i'm not I'm extremely sensitive to it. I have a lot of friends 
in the business, even that are drummers. And I'm like, man, doesn't that bother you that that snare sounds like it's a machine gun? They're like, oh, I don't even notice. I'm like, God, it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, you know, I just pay attention to the dynamics. It's it's critical. It's critical to me. But the guys that hate on them, I don't know, man. Those internet shit talkers, man. Like, find That's, something else better to do. Right. You know? So, um, we mentioned this. I, I, I asked you this briefly before we got going on this, but I... I want to uh, ask for the sake of our listeners. You mentioned that you've had to ghost to drummers before. Sure. And for if you guys don't know what I mean, when I say ghost to drummer, I mean you think that this one guy in the band played on the record, but uh-huh. maybe he just, for whatever reason, wasn't up to it um, right. for what was needed. So you bring in an outside guy to play drums in the album. My question is, how does that situation go over with everybody? Like, has it... Is it usually cool? Is it tense? Does the drummer that's being replaced for the album does he stick around and watch? Yeah, uh, it's never it's never been a big blowout. It's always been. Oh, I don't think I'm playing this very well. Is it so? It's something sometimes that occurs while the album's underway. Yeah, oh. it's always been like that. Oh, okay, cool. It's been a long time since I've had to. Um. Because we figured out ways to, 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 to get it done. And also, drummers have gotten better, man. Like, yeah. they, you know, at us over editing records in the, in the early 2000s, really, now these kids think that drummers actually played that stuff. And now they're coming in and actually playing the stuff. So, you guys had a hand in up in the game of drummer skills. I would have to say so. <laughs> because now I'm at the point where I'm not editing as much anymore. Like, I want to keep it loose. So do these, do, have you ever kind of like lifted up the curtain for these guys that grew up on the albums you made? And they're like, wait a minute. So, yeah. So I learned all this stuff thinking that was a, like a real human? Yeah. Oh, wow. totally. Wow. I mean, because there, there's the generation gap. I mean, I'm 36 and there's kids, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even say kids. I mean, you look at somebody like Alex Rudinger and and he's a, he's a dear friend. He, he will, t- oh, dude, I can't believe you did this record and... You know, but that record changed my life. And I'm like, dude, that's all those drums are fake, dude. <laughs> you know, or whatever. And he's like, no way. Wow. And I'm like, dude, you play that in your sleep, you yeah. know? And and a lot of guys that are a little bit younger, there was the monsters that are my age or older that, that can play this stuff. But there's a lot of guys that just got the shit edited out of them. Hmm. And that was what had to be done for the record. And now, especially, like, dude, it's so rare nowadays that I have drummers that come in, that come in that can't cut it. Most of the guys now are pretty sick. That's killer. Yeah. I love hearing that. Yeah. That's yeah. cool that in, in a roundabout way you had a hand in, 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 in that. I, I mean, I'm not trying to take credit for it, but I, it's the younger guys tell me that. Oh, you know, that that guy was so sick. I'm like, he really wasn't that no, sick. No, I'll give you credit, dude. Yeah, yeah. I connected the dots. You, yeah. you raised the bar. That's cool shit. Yeah, I mean, and, and but those guys wrote those parts too, you know, but it, it was, there was a, not a lot of guys that were really doing that stuff. I mean, really like, you know, everybody remembers when, when Metalcore just really was just popping off 2005 four you know and a lot of those drummers were you know just big metallica fans or something like that and a lot of them had never gotten into death metal and then they have a guitar player that was into at the gates and they're sucked into this band and they're you know it, or they're malevolent creation and they're, and they're trying to like you know haul ass and they're like oh, i can't do this you know dude that's so funny you say that because i, I remember that so well i I was sitting on, and I'm kind of jumping ahead because I know you're like really good friends with Berklin. Oh, yeah. So uh, I remember when I brought uh, John Berklin on board with Minel, and he was fresh with Devil Driver. Uh-huh. And I remember sitting on their bus with him in Atlanta, and he's we're listening to Master of Puppets and um, like air drumming to that. Yeah. And meanwhile, the bass player at the time, John, the original guy. The, the oh, Viking, Miller, yeah. The, the, yeah, Miller, the yeah. Viking looking dude. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about at the gates nonstop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it's just funny because I'm thinking, what the hell is at the gates? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're right. A bunch of Metallica kids. Yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, and, and Berklin is the ultimate Metallica kid. I mean, I thought I was a Metallica fan until I met that dude. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man. But you know, but he's got the chops. But there was a lot of guys then that were just you know we were doing these Roadrunner bands or things like that, and it was like you know we get these these developmental budgets and the drummers come in it's like ah (laughs) you know we gotta bring somebody in here yeah you know and it was always somebody like Kevin or Mark Castillo Kevin Talley or Mark Castillo or somebody like that come in and save the day and you know do it under the table and not you know that's it's not so common nowadays I get a lot of guys hey man let me know if you need work it's like man you know it's 
I don't need it as much anymore. Hmm. Well, these That's guys cool. are good. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Um, totally different question. Mm. Has your job affected the way that you enjoy music as a listener? Oh hell yeah! In a good way, a bad way? Uh... Um, man, I just think that yeah, probably in a bad way at some points. But now I'm kind of at peace with it. I I will say I don't seek out new music as much as I should. Um, so that's kind of affected that. As far as metal, it's just, man, like there's just not a lot of metal I want to hear, you know, these days. So maybe it's kind of desensitized me a little bit, but I you know, obviously believe passionately in the records I work on and all that stuff. But it's made me overanalyze the way everything sounds. But I also really think that I, that I, the stuff I love, I know that I love, you know. So. Is there a band that still releases albums that you look forward to their new album release? It's oh, okay. It's all right. Totally. To say no. no, totally. There is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Gojira, Meshuggah, uh, you know, any of the, you know, any of the Swedes I grew up listening to, I'm always going to listen to their stuff and, you know, my friends, things like that. But there's bands like Woven Hand, uh, it's a band out of Denver. They're, they're really uh, kind of dark stuff. I love that stuff. Um, any, like, I'm really into old soul and blues and jazz, which is obviously not a lot of new, that's new stuff like that coming out, but, um, like Budos band, I don't know if you've heard them. Like it's kind of like, let me know how to describe it. Big horn section and stuff like that. Like I listen to, to just different stuff, stuff that makes takes me away from the metal stuff, you know. And then I listen to the classics that I grew up on. But like if I'm at the gym, I don't even listen to music. Yeah, you know, it's like my time to to uh, to disconnect. And sometimes they'll play something I worked on and I'm like, Oh, how's it sound on the TV at the gym? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, so, you know, it's, but if I'm trying to squat a bunch of weight and I'm listening to how the snare drum sounds, it's probably not a great idea on my back. You know what I mean? Oh dude, no, you got to clear your mind. Yeah. Clear my mind. Yeah. People, I I go run every day, every other day in the summer and Mm -hmm. people ask me, so what are you listening to when you run? And I'm going nothing. Nothing. I I just want to clear my brain. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I've even just started like, I go on a lot of long drives and stuff, and I don't. I wasn't listening to a lot of music for a while, and now I've now I'm listening again, you know. And I've been listening to old stuff, or you know, like I said, the stuff like Woven Hand, or just trying to find things that that I enjoy, that you know aren't metal and take me somewhere. It's got to take me somewhere. Yeah, you know, it's like it's like a bad. You know, like when, I always say, it's like a bad movie. Like when you know you're watching somebody act, you know, yeah. like you you see the actor being an actor. Right. You want you want to lose yourself, and that's what that's the records I try to make. That's the music I want to listen to. Is, is I want to hear stuff that takes me somewhere. So yeah, anything like that. I mean, I, I I there's a million bands I do enjoy hearing. You know what they're doing, and like I think Toxic Holocaust put a new song the other day or today or something. I want to hear that. You know. Yeah. It's like that old thrash stuff. You know, I love that stuff. But as far as a metal man, it's I wish I got more excited about this stuff. Um, but I, it's probably just you know. Just one of those career hazards. You can't. Yeah. You can't avoid it. It's uh, no doubt about it. it. Well, so we were just talking about this is um, pretty much my last question or next to last, but we were talking about John Berklin a second ago. Uh huh. So he's been a minor artist forever and one of the best dudes of all time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the guy is as sweet as can be. Yes. Um. So, what a lot of people don't know about John is that he's a crazy prolific songwriter oh oh insane he's yeah. a he's a dave Grohl of metal right he, that that guy's written more stuff for devil driver he's for bad wolves he's a mind uh that people don't don't they don't understand and yeah i could i mean we could do a whole podcast on john and stories <laughs> and stories on john i mean i love him to death i mean him and i are the the best of friends and the worst of friends i mean like we really are because because him and i can fight and then just be best friends after. Like he he gets it and he has a vision and that's an awesome thing about John and guys like John is he has to know what happens if. He has to, to, to write the song, he has to try the producer, he has to try the the other drum or the other whatever. And he's always been like that, man. I mean, we've been working together for 15 years almost. Well, that's my question about John. So a guy like him, how often do you do you come across drummers who are way more uh, integral to everything with the band than just being the drummer? Not often. Not often, man. I mean, it's... Dude, he's so in tune with it, you know. He's, he's, almost, he's almost an idiot savant musically, you know. Like, 
not to, not idiot in a bad way, but he's oblivious to things like gear and like uh, whatever it may be. But his big picture mind is huge. I mean, he could be a brilliant producer, but he doesn't have the patience for it. You know, yeah. um, so he. You know, guys like that are are strange, man, and they're identifiable personalities. You know, you start to put personalities in in compartments. You know, because a lot of guys are, are similar people, and he just got that alpha thing, that, and you don't see it a lot. You don't see a lot of drummers that are capable of of that. You know, especially that level of songwriting. I mean, you see a guy like like Lars, who's this big mastermind, but Lars isn't a gu- guitar riff guy. Lars doesn't play eighty percent of the guitars, bass, and 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 all the drums on the record. Yeah. You know, but it's, I don't know. I mean, John, John uh, John's just a, uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely a rare case. I'm trying to think of who else is like, Steve from Deicide is like that. Steve Shine from mm-hmm. Deicide. Um, he's a writer like that, or Charlie Benante from Anthrax. He plays a lot of guitar, Charlie. Yeah, yeah he, he writes a lot of stuff. Well, so. it's interesting because, so you said there's not a lot of guys like that, yeah. and I totally get it. Yet earlier you said you tend to gravitate personally towards drummers. I do. It's what is weird. it about drummers? I don't know, man. Maybe because we spend so much time going crazy together. But, you know, it's not not that I, you know, I mean, some of my, you know, dearest friends are guitar players because that's the language I speak. <coughs> but something about drummers, you know, it's funny, like, you know, like you're talking about how close I am with John or Ben Harkle Road and I or, you know, guys like that, like, I don't know, man. Maybe we're just weirdos. We're just hilarious, you know, dumb people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's cool. But drummers also drive me absolutely insane, too. You know, so. <laughs> well, last question. Yeah. What are you working on right now, and what comes right after that? Havoc, right now. And it's almost done. It sounds great. Really, really killer record. And then I got to do some Whitechapel acoustic stuff. Um, which should be cool. I know that sounds weird, but it sounds totally weird. It's going to be very cool. Um, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that, but I don't think they'll care. Um, I did Nile before this, which came out just really cool. I don't think they've ever sounded like this. I know they haven't ever sounded like this. I mean, it did. And then, man, I got a, I got a couple Australian boys knocking at my door for the fall, which I can't say yet. And then I got some, Got to finish up. I mean, there's a ton of stuff on the books, but I got to finish up some stuff for a very affluent software company um, that people will be very excited about. Um, so you're booked until when that you know of right now? Sometime in the next year. So, nice. Yeah. Good for you. Got to be, man. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no lollygagging anymore in this business. You know, the the budgets are low and the and the work is not scarce, but it's. You know, it's intense. You gotta you gotta be ready to go. Dude. Mark, thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. I this was great. It. I, it was really cool. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>